it's interesting. On my way coming here, like I was really weighing up the importance to the music industry that you serve, just from a cultural perspective. Um, are you comfortable with knowing that you probably are our most successful export as a producer <laughs> to date? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't really think about things like that, but um, if I can inspire anybody to do something, you know, then I'm, I'm happy. You know, I want to, if I can show people that like things are possible that maybe they didn't think were possible, then that's, that's great. You know. I remember like back in the day, you had a, you had a song with Alicia Dixon years ago. <laughs> you know your research. <laughs> <laughs> Just the back day there, tell me like, at that, where were you in your career at that point as a producer? Oh, that was a low point, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That, um, yeah, that was great, man. That was like, you know, I was still just in my bedroom making making beats. Um, I think I was just like, I was in my second or third year at uni. And um, I can't even honestly remember how that happened. I think I met at A&R and like, and, and he heard one of the songs that I've been doing and and then, you know, she liked it and she wanted to cut it. And it was funny because I was, I was working um, at a studio called Metropolis, it's a famous studio in, in London, and um, like as like the receptionist, I was there for like five years, and like no one had known that I was I was a producer, and um, sorry, and uh, and then like I ended up recording the song of Alicia, and then like about two weeks after, I ended up recording with Rihanna there, and they were like, "Isn't that the receptionist? That's like how is he like recording with Rihanna? Like what is going on? You know?" So like it was kind of a funny time for me, but yeah, it was. I mean, it was great, and you know. Um, you know, she was, you know, she took a chance on someone that was like an unknown, so that was, that was good. She just liked the song, so. Because Rihanna used to be, she had quite a few of our writing caps at, yeah. writing caps at Metropolis. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And I was, when I was, when I was, at the start of like me working with Rihanna, I was still on reception. So like I would like work with her and then like for the first week and then I left, but for the first week I would work with her, then I would be on reception and then I would like work with her like, and I'm like, what is that? Everyone was so confused because I didn't tell anybody there that I was like trying to be a producer or anything, so. So roughly what year is that, about 09, 010? Yeah, it's probably like the start of 09. Okay. Yep, yep. So yeah, it was, it was funny. Um, you know, and all the, then all, like, all the bosses that, there, that were there were like being like, would they would like just dismiss me and wouldn't even like paying attention to me. We're like, oh, you know, you should do our studios. We should know, we got a great studio. They're trying to sell me the studio. I'm like, I've been here for five years. Like, I know what a studio is. <laughs> like, but you know, it's all good. So when you were at uni, what were you studying at that point? Audio technology. At, at which uni? Uh, TVU, but I guess it's called like West, called, like University of West London or something. The one in Ealing. Oh, okay. Yeah. So early on, you always knew that you were going to go into the world sound and music. Yeah. Uh, well, I you know I used to play football until I was like nine, eighteen, nineteen, and then once I kind of as I was falling out of love with that, my friend gave me Fruit Loops, and then um, I just fell in love in like instantly, and I just became obsessed with it. Since then, I just, then, I started, then I went to college and I, worked, I interned everywhere and went to college and then I, you know, ended up um, going to university. Can we backtrack a little bit? So interning, um, which is an important part for most people to get a foot into the music industry. Yeah. Where did you intern? I interned everywhere. I was the king of the interns. I interned initially at Metropolis. Um, I interned at Island Records. I interned at MTV. I interned um, at a place called Stanley House, another studio. Um, I was everywhere. Um, I, I loved it. I agree that it's like the most important thing you can do if you want to, if you want to work in a competitive industry. You got to like actually see what it takes and what it is. You, know, you can only do that from the inside. I think a lot of people when they go into the industry, they it's glamorous, but then they don't really know exactly what it is they want to do within it. Yeah. And I guess the internship is probably the best place to kind of like fool your way through. Is it PR? Is it marketing? Is it A and R? But when you were interning, what what positions were you interning in? I would just do everything. Like I would, it was like A and R. I, I assume, but it wasn't. Um, you know, if, if you're an intern, you got to do whatever. So, um, yeah. So I would just, you know, I, you know, a, a guy called Ferdy, um, who, oh, the boss. yeah, <laughs> Ferdy. I used to intern for Ferdy. He came to my university and and he did like a master class, and I, um, and I had a decision to make. I because you know, I was I had CDs and music, and I and. and you know, when you're like, at that time, everyone had CDs, so like you just give CDs out to anybody you met, you know, like, and it's just like, you're kind of like on autopilot. But then I started thinking, hang on, if I, I can give him my CD and tell him to sign me, but at the same time, if I give, like, if I ask for an internship, maybe I could just be with him all the time and then just have him give, I can give him all my CDs, you know? So I thought it was, that was the first time where I really started thinking a bit more longer term. And like, so I ended up like, you know, everyone afterwards was like, you know, ha like hounding him for like, to give him a CD to get signed, you know, to give him a demo. And I was like, you know what, I just want an internship. And so he gave it to me and then, 
I never ever gave him a CD ever. I still to this day, I, I still like, you know, we worked together a lot because when my label went through Interscope, he would put out the, the music in England. So like it kind of reversed where like he had to ask my approval for things, you know, <laughs> like, but, um, you know, so like I just, I just, that was the best decision I ever made, just ask for an internship and I could be around it and in it and learn about it, you know? So it was, it was a good, good decision to make. Well, most people, when their internship finishes, there's not always a place ready for them at the label. Yeah. So whenever those internships finish, were you ever decided thinking, ah, oh, like I'm not sticking on, or you just knew that you were going to go around and get as much experience as possible? Yeah, there's so much to learn. I never went there to get a job. I never went to university to get a degree. I just went there to learn. Like, I, I, the reason why I went to university was because I wanted to be around people that loved it enough to do it for four years as a degree, you know? And that was, I learned so much from that. And the reason why I went and did an internship is because I wanted to learn about, like, it's not just learning about the industry. It's like learning, like, the language that people use when they're in the industry. It's like learning like, the politics, learning why things that happen the way they happen, like, all that stuff, all the, like, the little intricacies are super important. And, like, I'm fascinated by all that. So um, I never wanted a job there um so when it came to like leave i was you know it was time i think i felt like i learned enough but um yeah i just you know i never was looking for a job i always wanted to be at that, at that point i wanted to be a music producer and you know and just like kind of work on things so it kind of seamlessly happened where like when i stopped at say metropolis i just finished my degree and then i ended up i was going back and forth to america while i was doing all these internships and then like i got offers and then I ended up just going to America like literally like, you know, like a month after I finished at Metropolis. So it all kind of worked out. So obviously you're acquiring knowledge and you know that you're going to use it for, in effect, your own yeah. career. I would see like, why these A&R, because before when you're on the outside, you're like, but this music's so amazing. Why is this A&R not like even calling me back? And then I would, you know, having the internship, I would understand why A, the music's probably not amazing and B, like, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, like, you know, timing is a lot of it, you know, like understanding, like they might be looking for a specific thing and you might not be that, you know, he might be about to be fired and he's not telling no one or, you know, like there's a lot that goes into it. He may just want to like sign this one thing because he might, you know, he feels like it's going to be a quick win and like, it's like a lot of decision making that happens. You don't see that from the outside. You're just like, this is amazing. Like this, is, this guy's an idiot. Why isn't he signing me? You know? <laughs> I mean, obviously, because obviously you've got your own situation. So how does A&R and how does it work on an industry perspective and then how do you view it? Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of times um, in big, like major labels, in any big company, there's a lot of short term thinking um, because the boss, the CEO generally, does, especially in the music business, doesn't own the company. They report to a board or they report to a, another major company that then reports to a board and they have to they have pressure. Like, they have quarterly P&L pressure. So they have to like, go in front of a board and say, this is how much money we made this quarter. And if it's not good, every single quarter, then it's bad. And if there's like a string of like bad quarters, then you get fired. So like, and every CEO of every company, you know, is not there for that long. They're there for two or three years. So like everything is very short term. So, and that fit was down to the A&R, you know? So everyone's like looking for, you know, if you told any CEO of any company, I've got the next Adele for you, but it won't become Adele for another 25 years, they won't sign it because they're, they're not going to be there in 25 years, you know? Like, so, so I try and, you know, the difference between that and what I do is that I own everything, you know? I'm, I'm going to be here in 25 years. Like, I'm, you know, so it's not about quick wins for me. It's about, um, it's about like the long, the long haul. And I want to be doing this in, in 25 years. Like, that's like a real, I want to have the option of like coming to work and being excited about things and like building something. So like, you know, I think that's the probably the most important thing about owning is that like you have a long term view and then you can do a lot more things if you can have a long, you can, you can really attack, you know, and solve interesting problems when you have a long term view. So that's the difference I think. If you look at just keeping your assets, um, when you look at then the whole thing with the P&L, that, and having to report to external shareholders who don't naturally have the music at the interest of the artist as well. Was there any point during your time when you were the intern or even just in the industry where you were a bit jaded by it all? Nah, when I was intern, no way. I, I wasn't even understanding that. I didn't really get that from my internship. I was more understanding like the local politics of like, why this A&R has a job and why this A&R gets paid twice as much as that A&R and like, right. what, how did that even happen? Like I was, it was a lot more, it wasn't as big as like, you know, board meetings and stuff. I never, <laughs> never let me into a board meeting. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, it was more about like the fundamentals. And I, what I was interested in was like, how do people get signed? How do hit songs become hit songs? Like, what is it about that song as opposed, you know, everyone hears songs that are amazing that don't go nowhere or artists that are amazing that don't go nowhere. And then like, you'll see like someone, you'll be like, 
that person's all right, but like, how are they like the biggest thing on the world? Like, you know, and it's because of what happens behind the scenes. Like, it's like, you know, talent, like singing well is like one part of it. Like, that's, a, that's a small part, or rapping well is like one part of it. The rest of it is like your hustle and like how you get people to work for you and how you get people excited. And like, that is a whole different game that you don't see from the outside. You only see that when you, when you go inside, you know? So that was a super important learning curve. I mean, like I said to you before we started, is that um, I remember like a good few years ago, I remember I used to have some blog posts and I think a lot of it was to try and almost bridge some of the gap of like the information and make people to be aware of how things actually work. Do you think potentially um, within, let's just use the word, the urban industry, that there's a lack of information, a lack of understanding of like how songs get to radio, how, you know, budgets can get frozen, you know, just publishing do you th- and then do you think that that kind of like hinders us like moving forward and being competitive yeah totally i feel like we just actually started that up again that the audio corner so we do try and like help give information but um yeah no i think it absolutely it doesn't help you know you gotta like um you know it's 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 uh it's hard when like people that are running companies don't really understand the culture of say you know black music like you know that is that's just going to be hard for any if they don't understand the fundamental culture it's going to be you know they obviously the goal is to employ people that do and then they do it but like if the person running the company doesn't get it it's hard you know um to like look at it from the because when you're a ceo you're looking at like revenue you, again your whole life is about like that quarterly board meeting you know that's where you live and die so like you're looking at numbers and like numbers don't always tell you the truth you know, they, 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 they don't tell you what's coming in the future all the time, you know. So, um, so yeah, it, it, that is a challenge. And I do think that, like, you know, information is key and, like, understanding and, like, more people kind of owning their own thing, coming from the culture, I think is important. That's why I think, you know, what's happening in England with, like, Skepta and Stormzy and stuff, like, staying independent and doing great, like, that's super important because then if Skepta gets to a point where, let's just say he puts out another album and it's, and it's amazing, then maybe he's like signing like, you know, five artists after that. And then like, he can talk about it because he understands the cult, you know, so like it just, it changes the dynamic of like, um, you know, someone else being in that position. So I think, I think it's getting way better. I think like it's only going to continue to improve because we have the internet and that helps information get to everybody, but it's going to be a process, you know? Somewhat the illusion of what we're seeing with um, artists today, like when they sign a deal, everyone thinks, right, you sign a deal, you're gonna get a number one. You're gonna tour. You're gonna do such and such and such. What, what what's the kind of like misconceptions you think of an artist signing a deal with expectations of just like getting number one and like ruling the world like a Beyonce? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you just look at the statistics, like you know, the amount of people. Like I, I looked at this the other day because I was looking from from my record label's perspective. But like, I think if, if you're a new artist on a major record label, and this is global, this isn't like just England, but you got a zero point five seven percent chance of like going gold you know um and that's not a good percentage you know so like a lot of these labels have like 100 at least in america i'm not sure how many in england but they have like 170 artists signed to them so you got you know out of 170 people you got a 0.5 percent chance of like doing anything you know so i think that's that should tell you everything you know that the fact that like you know you're not is that getting signed is one thing getting signed is like having a bank loan then you gotta like put it to good use you know and that's the hardest part you know there's very few artists that really make it and have a career um so yeah but i think people are getting smarter now i think people see that like you know that like just getting signed doesn't mean you know anything really it just you know it just gives you more tools to like you know hopefully we will go on and do good things but like i think people are getting smarter like, in the old days it was i think because there was less information people would just see the superstars and think everyone if you're signed you're going to be a superstar now people see all the failures like people see all the people that are getting dropped people see all that and like you know they're like we know it's not going to be necessarily like number one if I just get signed, you know? Yeah. All right, well, let's, we'll get back onto that, but um, the single. Yes. Not easy. Um, my interpretation of it was, it was a, it was a love song, yep. but I felt like it was somewhat fatalistic, <laughs> you know, a childhood sweetheart type of situation. How, how do you interpret it? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a concept. Like, it's not like about one specific story. Um, and I like twisting, like I like films. I like any storytelling where like things are not what they seem. And I like the idea of like, you know, normally in love songs, like there's one good person that's like, you know, that's getting their heart broken and there's a bad person that's breaking their heart. Like in, in this, I wanted to try and twist that and just say, let's look at it from the person that's actually breaking the heart. Like, um, 
maybe make them the good person and like talk about their struggle, you know, and like, you know, the person that's normally the baddie, like actually that like, they have a perspective too that could be interesting. So, you know, and it doesn't have to even be about romance. It could be about like, you know, a lot of times people give me demos like, I, and I say, oh, shit, like that's, that's breaking someone's heart. That's like, you know, that's like, you know, or, or whatever, like, or like your mum has, you know, is, has cancer or something called, you know, like, you know, these, it's like heartbreak is like, everyone's been through it on some level, you know? So like, it's something that I think a lot of people can relate to, but also looking at it from the point of view of the person breaking the heart as opposed to like the person that the heartbroken, I think is interesting. So that's kind of the concept. No, it's a great, and it's, it's, it's easy listening, you know, right. it's easy listening. And it's just um, something I definitely keep rotation. Um, when you actually look at some of your quote unquote big hits, what would, what would be, let's say the top three big hits that you, the biggest hits that you've had so far as a producer? Uh, the ones that I've sold the most or streamed the most are probably Love the Way You Lie with Eminem and Rihanna, um, Radioactive with Imagine Dragons, and um, I don't know what the third one would be. Uh, this Sucker for Pain song I just did this year with Suicide Squad. That's that's you know that's been streamed over you know half a billion times now. So like that's that's a pretty big one. Um, but there's a, there's a few, but. Um, would you say what is the like the 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 two would you feel like the biggest ones yeah i'd say probably those three the streaming actually you know you see a lot of people talk about streaming that doesn't seem to work out too well for like the artists um on a producer end is it the same type of issue that the revenues coming on the back end isn't what they could be yeah the, um i think so basically it's going to take a there's, there's a lot of money in streaming but like how it gets distributed is like being worked out <laughs> and so like um Spotify, for example, have been really good about like showing people numbers, you know, and they want all the artists and creators to like understand how much things you can go on any you know Spotify and you can see how much listeners you got per month. You can see how many you know every single thing is is like documented, um, and that's going to lead to a lot more transparency. But like, so there's a lot of money being made, but like you know, it's the process of how to pay people is still being worked out, you know. So um, I think in the next. You know, as it grows, streaming is growing exponentially. So, like, as it grows in the next five or six years, it's going to be a real revenue source for people. But um, for labels, you make money right now. Artists don't really make money, and producers don't really make that much money. But labels are starting to make money, and it's going to be, you know, labels are going to hold on to that money, and then it's going to slowly, you know, trickle down. But um, it's going to take a second, I think. But there's going to be big growth in music. So now, like, our producers who maybe independent, they can't negotiate their own deals. With a independent labels can yeah they can negotiate they can, and again if you're a label like if you're if you're XL and you have like Adele you're, that's a label like you're making real money from from streaming but if you're Adele I mean Adele might be different because she has a pretty different contract but if you're like a new artist then you're you're probably not making that much money right now but um, but yeah if you're a label if you end up like Skepta is a label like you know like if you're if you're the label if you own the masters then then you'll make you can make real money from streaming starting probably this year you know, when, at the end of last year. I mean, it's based on basic. What, what is defined masters? A lot of people hear it and they don't actually know conceptually what it means yeah. for an artist and why it's important to have so it. In the old days, you would have, everything would be on tape. So like, you know, owning the actual, like the physical tape that like, if you wanted to make a copy of that tape, um, you had to like use the original master. Right? That's where it comes from. Um, so basically owning the, but now it's just about IP. So owning the rights to a piece of, you know, intellectual property like being the owner of it. So if anyone wants to license it, if anyone wants to use it in any way, if someone wants to play it in a bar, if someone wants to use it in a TV commercial, if someone wants to like play it on the radio, they have to pay the rights owners. And so like, obviously the master is like the recorded side and the publishing is who wrote wrote the song, you know, so. So where did you, I know obviously you've obviously been interning back in the day, but where did you get your real industry practice know-how from like who was mentoring you or what books are you read and what information were you acquiring at that point i mean with, like when i first started coming up youtube wasn't even a thing but you can learn so much from youtube um i do it now all the time on things that are music related or not you know just like i learn from music um but yeah like i think just like having like an interest you know and just like like just asking a lot of questions like you know like how does that work like being an intern you get you have like access to like people that should know the answers to these questions so like whether they do or not they might not but um you should be able to ask like how does how does publishing work how does you know that's, an, that's another advantage of being an intern but um now you can just go online man you can just like type in how does publishing work on youtube and you'll find out like there's no excuses to not know now like information is out there so um yeah, I, i've had mentors but um to learn the basic stuff about like how the music industry works i just think that 
most people know, and you can ask questions when things come up or just read books. I, I, I got this book, when I was at university, I learned some stuff too, because they, they force you to read certain books. Um, there was a book that everybody read, I think. Um, the Dog Passer? Yeah, 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 reading that, which was, looking back now, is like, that's like, if you're reading that now, that's it's like amazing. so old school, yeah, yeah. They're talking about like shipping stuff and like, yeah, the label. Yeah, yeah. Back to that cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's a whole different business with streaming, but um, yeah, you can just you can just go online, man. Just there's no excuses. If you're if you want to be a creative or anything in the music business, you got to understand the business because it affects everything you do. You know, so you, you can't be one. Of the, I I really have got no time for people that say yeah, I just want to make the art like because if you're a real artist, you want to you want to influence everything that influences your art, and business is a massive part of it. You know, so. And it's so easy to learn now. There's no excuses, you know? Yeah. With what you're creating, do you feel like you're, it's almost like you're creating also a disruptive model with your own, because you, it's like a one, what do they call it? One stop, one, one stop shop. shop. Yeah, <laughs> everything. Um, talk to me about that and then also um, some of the stuff you've been doing with IBM as well. Yeah, so um, we have like, a, now it's kind of expanded from just a record company to um, a record company that has like a new business model that like partners more with artists as opposed to like just signs them. Uh, we have a publishing company, we have a creative agency and a production company where we do like, you know, all of our production stuff. We just started signing directors too. Um, so yeah, it's like a kind of, it's just about expanding and kind of it all, the foundation of it is obviously music and like, but like, I just see all these, when I start, just like when I start my record label, I'd see that like, there's all these gaps or things that can do better or things that can influence the, like, the end result of like having a hit song or a song that people like. So I just wanted to be in the business of those things so I could help the process of like developing an artist or a song or whatever. So um, so it kind of all just happened organically. Um, and the thing with IBM is, you know, we have a creative agency and we, we took on IBM as a client and... Um, so how does that actually come to fruition? Because that's, that's a gap to, <laughs> yeah. to close. So basically over the summer, I did a, 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 like a, I took an investment from a company called WPP who are an English company, they're like a, the biggest holding company in the world for owning creative agencies and, and uh, media buying companies. They do like $22 billion a year in revenue. They're, they're massive, they've got like 160,000 people that work there. So, and they're from England, like the, the CEO of it is like from Mill Hill. <laughs> it's hilarious, yeah, this guy called Sir Martin Sorrell. So, um, and he, he just makes me laugh. So like I ended up doing a deal with uh, like a, an investment with them and they have like, they're responsible for like every commercial you see in the world every like three, they're responsible. They either buy the media for it or they, they make the creative. Like they're responsible globally, like in India, in, they're a massive company. So I um, ended up doing, taking an investment from them and putting Martin on my board. And um, they have, they know everybody. Like they've had IBM as a client for 30 years, you know? So, so basically what I'm going, I'm, I'm using their network to like talk to a lot of these big brands and elevate the whole my whole thing is elevating music a lot of these big brands they don't really they think about music as like like number 10 on the list of things to do when they're thinking about like marketing and just you know how they operate in the world and i'm i'm there saying challenging that and saying music should be number one music should be the first thing you think about because that you probably have like if you're ibm you probably have like a snapchat strategy and a facebook strategy but music is the, the best tool you have to like make your consumers emotional around your product and you should think about it before any of those other things. Those other things, Snapchat's been here for 10 years. Snapchat, Snapchat might be here in 50 years, we don't know. Music will be, music has been here from the start of humanity and it will be here at the end. Like it's, it's not going nowhere, it's so important. And you should think about it like that. You should be number one. So that's basically what I do. So I try and elevate music when I talk to these decision makers, these CEOs and these CMOs. So we end up doing, we end up, you know, uh, you know, taking on IBM as a client, and then we did all we built out this. Uh, they have a, 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 like AI, artificial intelligence, this computer called Watson that they're kind of doing things with. So we end up helping to market that in the world using music, and me as the artist and the song is all part of that. You know, so we do all of that for people. So it's like, the next step for me is like you know, I've done, I've been lucky enough to do some things in music that like breaking artists and having hits and stuff. Now for me, it's like how do I influence these big companies that have real power? and show them that music is way more important than they're thinking about, you know? That's like exciting to me because they're just having more hits is like, it's cool, but I've done that already, you know? I wanna, I wanna try and take, you know, music. I want if, if I can do anything, I wanna try and like elevate it and make it more important in the world. So that's the fight I'm on right now. Yeah, it's not, not to make comparisons, but it's a bit like Steve Stout when he was, you know, coming yeah. in and talking to brands of China, the whole talent of America. Absolutely, Steve's done a great job with translation, but the difference between us and, like, no one does what we do in the world because Steve's not a creative. Like, Steve can't, Steve knows creatives, but I'm like, 
the owner of the company plus I make the music. So like it's a different, it's just a different point of view, you know? And Steve is great. I've known like Jimmy and mentor Steve too. So like I've known Steve for a while and Steve is, but it's like we need more people like Steve that like understand both brands and music because the, the work will just be better. Like the things that the, the brands end up doing will be better and you know, and they spend a lot of money and they have a lot of influence. So it's important to get that right. Otherwise you just see a lot of cheesy shit all the time. That's like, doesn't help anybody, you know? When you go to, do they, do they get it all the time or is it like, they yeah. see the unicorn when you're selling them like, the <laughs> obvious thing? It's funny because they don't really like, you know, I'm not like, there's not that many like, people of like my hair and my like coming from Wagri and coming to talk to them, you know? So like, <laughs> so like they're like a bit taken aback, but that's part of the reason why I did the investment with Martin because he has 50 year relationships with all these people. So like, you know, like he can, and I like that. I like the fact, like Steve is way more put together than me. Steve's wearing suits. Steve is like in there, he can, like, I'm not that guy. I'm a creative, I'm like, you know, I'm from a place that, you know, is not the nicest place. So like, um, so yeah, so like, I like, but I like that. Cause these people should be exposed to people from a green. Like they should be exposed to like more than just their bubble. The reason why things stay the same is cause people stay in their bubble, you know? And I, and I like challenging that and saying, you know what? we do something completely different over here. Music is more important than you're, th you're a smart person, but you're not thinking about this in the right way. And here, this is how you can do it. And people so far have been super like, you know, we, we're working with massive brands, you know, we're working with movie studios now, we're working with a lot of heavy hitters and people love it, you know? So hopefully it continues. Just, just rounding up, um, so, so you worked with Rihanna. Yeah. Um, when you made those records, were you in the studio together or was it can you tell us a bit about what that recording experience was like working with Rihanna? Yeah, yeah, Rihanna. Um, she's like one of the best A&Rs I know. Like she is, um, we, at one point we had the same management. So like, you know, I've, I've known Rihanna since. She was one of the first people I've ever worked with, you know, and, and when, I was, when I was done, at, still being like an intern working at Metropolis and we was working together from, from then. So um, she's, she's amazing in terms of like, she knows like, like, you know, obviously she has people like Jay Brown, and Ty and Jay Z like around her and like she bounces ideas off of them but she's the A&R. At this point like um, we just worked together recently and like you know they are there but they're not making like she's making all the creative decisions like she knows exactly what she wants um, and like you know from the outside looking in like going back to your original point like if you're just a girl like in a council estate saying I want to be like Rihanna like you probably like, to be like Rihanna you gotta like you gotta have a real interest in business. You gotta have a real vision for business and for creative. And you gotta be like, you know, you gotta be really focused. You know, it's not just like singing a song in a music video. Like she's a real, like she's like, she, you can tell she's learned a lot from Jay. Like Jay is not just a rapper. Like he is someone that has a real vision beyond just rap, you know? So that's what it really means to be like Rihanna or Jay or someone like that, like, you know? And like, if you are lucky enough to get around them, that like you can see it. But like, for the person that can't be around them, it's like you just see them on videos. You know, like, oh yeah, I want to be, I want to like talk about coke and like rap about that shit. <laughs> but it's more to it than that, you know. So that's the reason why they're successful, and that's the reason why they have insane careers. Is because it's not because they necessarily like sing better than everybody else or dance or like look better than everybody else. Because there's a lot of pretty good voiced people out there. It's the fact that like their hustle game is different, you know, and that's important to know. Yeah, I was at, like I said, when I went to one of the um, writing camps, I was with um, Eric Benninger, mm. um, and that's when it's like Metropolis. Oh yeah, so Eric, they were in like, was it Studio One? And then he was just like, I was like, so how does it work? Like, like you're like, Rihanna, like, every, it's like everyone's working in different, right. and then she'll go to the room, and then she'll listen, and she'll see if she connects with it or not, and the ones that she likes, she'll be like, yeah, that's, that's working out. But I was like, but who picks it? Who picks this? He's like, no, she does. Mm. If, she, if she likes it, she goes for it. And I think at that point, a lot of people thought that she was really like not making all of the decisions. Right, right. But when I was hearing, I was like, okay, that, yeah. that quite that impressed me quite a lot. Yeah, she would go like, she'd be like, yeah, can you change these drums? Can you do this? And you know, I say no, and then <laughs> she'd be like, all right, well, I'm not using them. I'm like, all right. Where's the industry going? Because when I spoke to Brad McKnight, he said that he perceives that the major label structure is going to basically become not obsolete, but they're going to have to start partnering more and more of artists. It's not yeah. gonna be like owning everything, you know, just straight three sixty deals. But from your take, how do you see the market of the major label? Well, yeah, for the first time in eighteen years we've got like an upswing in music. We're making you know, we've made more money this year than we made last year. That's because of streaming. So that's important. That's good to know it's important. We dealt with the internet terribly like the music business has been run horribly for, for a long time. And we dealt with the you know the internet 
in the, that's why we had almost 20 years of decline was because people were making short-term decisions when they should have had a 20-year plan they had like a, a, a tw you know a six-month plan <laughs> so so that's that's where we've come from uh, where it's going is like super opt I'm super optimistic you know there's going to be I've seen projections from just like all the streaming services of what what they're going to make what specific artists are going to make the top ones and like it's, there's a lot of money um, and we just have to make sure we manage it better because when we had this last time with the CD age the management of it was terrible. Like everyone got super competitive and everybody like started fighting against each other. And like everybody, like if we were to get together as one music business, if we had like a union or something, like we would have, we would have so much power. But like what happens is that like everyone in fights and then like these tech companies come and they basically, uh, you know, it's like developing countries versus developed countries. The developed countries kind of stay together and like they, they corrupt the leaders and then all the people in the country suffer and they keep that dynamic going. That's how, power works so the same thing happens with tech and music like we give our ip to, to to tech companies all the time like apple would never give us their phone to sell for them and then like char like that would never happen that's what they make we give our music away to these platforms and then like you know and it just becomes but now that's changing because like music companies have ownership in spotify and it is changing and people are getting smarter but it's just taking a long time but having said all that i feel like we are in a, a great space like it's only going to get better you're going to see more people partner for sure you're going to see more independence you're going to see more people like going like having a big impact independently and major labels are going to definitely change their model um because they're going to have to you know and it's going to change the way everybody thinks about doing business and music and i think like in the next five to ten years like if you can create that's why i'm so excited about what we're doing and other companies like us because if you can create a new a new paradigm, a new dynamic, then you can, it can become the new way of doing things. Like we're at that stage right now where like everything is so like, it can, if one person has major success doing one thing, everyone's gonna follow them. Like we're, like we're at that stage where everything, all the rules are being rewritten. So like it's super important now, if you've got an idea, if you have any kind of like, uh, you know, like power or like if you have, like now is the time to be independent, own what you do and like go for it. Because like, you know, the music is only gonna keep on growing, like the, the business side of it. And, you know, there's going to be money to do things. So people are not going to be starving because of streaming. Um, yeah, and you're going to be able to like, and you've got the internet, which is the biggest and best tool we've ever had, you know, to create and like distribute. So it's a great time to be in music.